Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our fifth webinar on Stewart Rope from the Lifting Solutions Group. Today, uh, we're going to talk about end terminations and cutting ropes with my colleague Ellen Bauman from Menas Belgium. Before we talked about the basics of steel wire rope, uh, special cable, lubrication and inspection, visual and MRT. But today we're going to talk about end terminations and cutting ropes. Uh, my name is Michel de Vos. I'm marketing manager from the Menas Group and I will be your uh, guide to the webinar. Um, Please remind me that you're on mute and if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in the chat. And after Alain his uh, story, we'll have some time to do a Q&A and he will answer most of your questions. And if not all questions are answered, we will send them afterwards. We will also send afterwards this presentation and the recording of, uh, of this, this webinar. Um, first of all, um, let me see, I need this one. A short introduction about our company. Um, we're part of uh, Axel Johnson International, which is a privately owned industrial group that inquires and develop, develops companies uh, in several strategic niche markets. And the Lifting Solutions Group is one of those six business lines within Axel Johnson International. So we're in Lifting Solutions Group. Um, it's working. Yeah. What do we do? Uh, we're a global player specialized in lifting equipment, steel wire rope uh, and services, but also fall protection uh, operating as a group. Um, 22 groups, companies in the group within 19 countries and every country has almost its own uh, local company that serves local customers. Here you see a little footprint of our company within the world. Um, mostly is uh, situated in Europe and Scandinavia, but since uh, a couple of years we have Australia with five companies and we also have the part in the USA since uh, I think it's last year. Uh, so we're pretty much spread it into the world. Um, this is our group. Uh, within Lifting Solutions uh, uh, Group, uh, as said, local, uh, a group of companies with local, with strong local brands and presence and serving customers worldwide. And I think one of those logos looks familiar for you. Uh, one of those, yeah. Uh, last slide for this introduction, then I'll hand over to Alain. Uh, this is our promise to the customers. We don't only sell products, we sell expertise, safety, quality, service. Uh, that's our main goal in everything we do, which is named the lifting know-how. For now, the short introduction. Um, oh, last slide, of course, subjects already know and terminations, cutting ropes, and now hand over to Alan. Enjoy. Well, very good morning from me to everybody who's listening and Viewing, good morning, good morning. My name is Alain Bauman. I'm an industrial engineer. And for the last uh, 36 years, I've been, uh, let's say, working, advising, investigating ropes at uh, Manus Belgium. Uh, we do service life reports. We have a little laboratory to investigate ropes which come back from customers. We climb into cranes. We go to the customers and advise them to have longer lifetimes, to go to specialized ropes for their applications and so on, yeah? So if you need advice, just give us a call, you put it on mail and we do our best to give you also our advices. Okay, what we're gonna do today is um, talking about uh, end terminations on steel wire rope. As Michel already said, the first seminars were about uh, standard ropes, about high performance ropes, about uh, discarding ropes. Then we had a seminar about uh, greasing and regreasing ropes. OK, let's talk today in 20 or 25 minutes about end terminations, because uh, if you've got a good rope, it's very important to also have a good end termination on your rope. Yeah? And here you see some examples. You see some eyes, some timbles some sockets. Okay, let's talk about these things. 
which have their certain applications and reasons why and the advantages and disadvantages. OK. One of the most common uh, end terminations on uh, ropes is the switched frill. Uh, let's say Tallurit uh, is a common uh, uh, brand in that. That's a mechanical splice. It is uh, you make a loop or uh, you put a timbal in your rope and you are going to uh, press uh, the uh, ferrule on your rope. So um, you do it with uh, a certain number of ferrule and that uh, has to be done with certain dies on your machine or your equipment. And uh, then you have a lasting eye or a lasting timbal in it. Uh, you see the table on the right. This is, uh, let's say, uh, very important to check which kind of rope you're going to uh, uh, press or you're going to uh, switch a, a thimble or an eye on it. You, that depends on the fill factor. So the fill factor uh, will give you uh, the right number of ferrule to use and dies. In general, if you have a rope uh, with a fiber core, you're going to need the same number as your diameter. Yeah. If you have a, a rope with steel core, you're going to add one number up to the diameter. Yeah. And if you have a special rope, let's say compacted, you need to have uh, two numbers up uh, for uh, uh, taking the right uh, ferrule. Uh, check it out because it's very important. Each rope has so his uh, specific uh, ferrule and dies uh, to use. Um, it is an aluminium uh, ferrule. That means uh, you can use the rope or the end termination till 110 degrees Celsius. Um, so be careful, but normally it is uh, generally uh, uh, common. It's easy and it's cheap to manufacture, so this will do the job. The efficiency uh, for your uh, rope will be 90%. That means that uh, doing the ferrule uh, uh, swaging will give you a loss of about 10% of your minimum breaking load. Huh? Um, as you can see down there, uh, you have standard uh, ferrules, but also you have uh, conical ones. So, uh, which is, uh, let's say, also with a, a conical with a little eye in it. So then you can see that the rope is uh, fully through the ferrule. And where I put the arrow, you can see that normally uh, to inspect that the ferrule and the rope are well uh, uh, switched, you need to see a little end of uh, the rope coming out, uh, showing out of the ferrule, so that everybody is sure that uh, the two sides of the rope is uh, completely switched. Yeah. The second type of uh, swaging is what uh, we call the Flemish eye or super loop. Flemish eye, well, I'm from Flandern and I can't explain why everybody in the world calls it a Flemish eye. Is it the Flemish invention? I don't know, but even in Russia, even in, uh, in, in French, even in all the different languages, it is called a Flemish eye. And you can do it on six and eight strand ropes. Yeah? what um, the, 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 the procedure is, you split your rope, so in two parts, we're going to see a movie afterwards, so I explain it first and then you're going to see the movie. It is spliced by hand into a loop or you put a, a timbal in it, and then if you got the loop, uh, then you're going to, uh, um, uh, you're going to uh, switch it with a steel uh, ferrule, yeah, a conical one, and then you have, let's say, uh, the complete uh, splice and swaging, and it, uh, uh, it had the advantage that you could go up to 150 degrees Celsius because it's a steel ferrule, and even to 300 uh, degrees Celsius, you're going to lose about 25% of your minimum breaking load, but anyhow, so for uh, high temperature applications, this is the one, let's say, to use. The efficiency is also 90%, so you're going to lose, let's say, about 10% of the minimum breaking load. Yeah. So let's see now how things are uh, manufactured. 
I think we're going to start the movie now, yeah. Uh, first, you just uh, put a line on it uh, where the pharaoh will come and then uh, look at it. The guy is going to split the rope into two parts. So this is a six strand rope, I think, yeah. So you see he takes three strands and he leaves the uh, rope core and the other three strands. Then he put uh, a clamp on it and then he's going to make a loop. You see there's a, a special procedure. You have to know if you're working with six strand or uh, eight strand ropes, if it is uh, with a steel core or if it is with um, a fiber core. There's all a, a certain procedure for it. It is, uh, let's say, know how, uh, how you do it. You see he splice the three strands back into the loop. This is a small diameter, but you can imagine if you were talking about, uh, I don't know, 58 millimeter, then you're going to need two guys to, uh, to do this job. Yeah. yeah, so each strand goes back into position. Yeah. OK. And the last one. Yeah, so you got an eye. Now we can put a, a timbre in it if you want. Yeah, but he's going to splice now these uh, little ends into the rope and then, yeah, you're going to pull the steel ferrule over this splice. Yeah. So this is a sometimes a harsh situation. I mean, sometimes you need to uh, have some equipment to really slide it over. Okay, so this is the first step. If you leave it like this, this hand splice will give you about 75% of the minimum breaking load. So in some emergency cases, you could use a Flemish eye, just splices like this, and then you end up with 75% of the minimum breaking load. Yeah. Now we're gonna uh, finish it up with the swaging. Let's hope it starts. Yeah, OK, so then you need to put your dices, special dices into the machine. And then for some uh, diameters you use once, for other diameters you use two times uh, your swaging dice. OK, you can see he turns it and yeah, till the dice are completely closed. Yeah, and then he puts it into another die, let's say. OK. So he turns it and he waits till the two dies get completely closed. Yeah, OK, that's it, guys. So you have your complete Flemish eye super loop switched and termination. There you go. You see it is conical. So sometimes it has the advantage uh, that, uh, yeah, it, it can be easily uh, uh, used underneath uh, your your loads to, to, to pick it up. OK. Yep. OK, another termination is the switch forged terminal. You're going to uh, have different kinds of, um, let's say, types you see here. Uh, some with an eye or some with a fork or there are some applications where you need a thread end. Yeah, it is all uh, done uh, as uh, seen with special dies uh, to switch on. Yeah, um, sometimes there are some standard dimensions you're going to need to put into the dies or sometimes you're going to end up with custom made things. So be careful, uh, not everybody has uh, all the dice, uh, let's say, uh, in the workshop. So sometimes you need to, to go to some standard dimension. It is, of course, expensive because these things uh, yeah, have to uh, be uh, made properly and all the different kinds of dice, yeah, they, they also cost uh, a lot of money. Efficiency is 90%. And uh, yeah, OK, so um, um, this is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, very special uh, with uh, these uh, kind of forged terminals. 
even for uh, end stops, you can use the same uh, procedure. You're going to switch uh, that uh, end stop also on the rope with special uh, dies. Yeah. Um, sometimes you have uh, very special uh, end stops with dimensions for Liebherr, Demark, Fautadano. Uh, these dimensions, they depends on the socket you're going to use uh, on your crane. Um, these end stops switched are normally done on new rope. Yeah. So the diameter of a new rope well, will fit uh, into these uh, end stops. And attention, if you're going to use it uh, due to uh, damages you're going to have on uh, used ropes, then be careful. Normally we do a test then uh, to see if the fitting is 100% safe. Uh, so you have uh, in the pictures different uh, uh, types of um, uh, end stops, round ones, uh, special ones, though be careful. Um, uh, these dimensions have to be checked. Yeah. Another very common uh, end termination are sockets. Uh, sockets uh, like you see here, uh, so open spelter socket uh, or closed ones um, with certain pins or with uh, bolts and so on. So this kind of socket is the strongest end termination and it is reusable. Uh. So if you're going to use it uh, with uh, a spelter socket with a wire lock uh, with raisin uh, poured on, normally you can uh, empty the socket afterwards and you can use it again. So sockets are reusable. This gives you a, a price advantage. How is it done? Well, um, this is uh, uh, the only uh, uh, end termination which gives you 100% of the breaking load of your rope. And uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, so uh, with a certain procedure uh, done, I give you a little show here how this thing has to be done. First of all, you have to uh, size your um, wire, yeah, like it is uh, there in the pictures. So you need to, to, to seal your rope. Then you open up all the different strands, yeah, even uh, the um, center core. If it is a rope core in it, you have to cut the rope core out of it. Yeah. And then you open up all the strands to form uh, a broom. Yeah? This broom uh, has uh, afterwards be, uh, ne it's necessary to degrease it because you have in your rope normally, you have a certain amount of grease. But for socketing, the, uh, the broom has to be 100% clean. So we have to do some degreasing on this part of your rope. Yeah. Then you pull the socket over it and then you make your uh, two compound um, reason. Normally it is a powder and a fluid which has to be mixed thoroughly. And then, uh, OK, you pour it into the socket and then you wait about, let's say, half an hour or an hour, depending on the, the, the temperature or, or the, 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 the um, greatness. I mean, the, the dimensions of the of the socket. Yeah, you wait for, let's say, one hour and then you can use your uh, socket and your rope immediately. Uh, this was the first uh, um, raisin which was uh, uh, certified by Lloyds. So it is still the original one, let's say, invented in England. You can use uh, these end terminations still 150 degrees Celsius. Be careful, there are other uh, raisin types which are not uh, usable till 150 degrees, yeah, only till 70 or 80 degrees. And be careful uh, if you use these things on, let's say, uh, a dredging uh, ship, yeah, if uh, these uh, sockets are into the sun, let's say in the, the Pacific or something, this uh, can uh, get easily up to, to 100 degrees in tropical situations. So be careful. Yeah, and I have to mention also that this uh, wire lock is coming into sets. You have the fluid and you have the, uh, uh, the, the, the powder to mix. There is an expiration date on uh, your sets, so be careful uh, that you use the, the, the right ones. 
This is socketing. Let's see how this works in practice. We have a little movie to show you. If you've seen it once, you're going to remember it forever, I think. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, something's gone wrong. Just turning back. I think, yeah, OK. There it comes. Yeah. Sorry, guys, but uh, yeah, this is technique. OK, OK, let's do it. So first of all, if you have to uh, have the right uh, dimensions, where the socket is coming, which part of the rope is to be needed to open, and then you have to seize it thoroughly. Look at this. This is well done, I think. It's a menace invention, I think. OK, you see. Yeah, very well seized. And then you open up all the strands. I think this is an eight strand rope. So every strand has to be opened up like this. Again, if you have a, a steel core, you open up the steel core too. If you have a fiber core in it, you cut the fiber core. Yeah, you cut it out. If you have a high performance rope with plastic uh, infill, you have to cut the plastic infill too. So all the strands now have to be opened like this. You see some specific tools we have also invented yeah, to open up this easily. All the different wires have to be spread into a very nice broom. Yeah, open up thoroughly. You see that all these wires still have a little uh, grease on it. Yeah, you make a very nice broom and then you go degreasing the broom. Yeah, you have several kinds of degreasers to use. And once you see here, the wires are degreased. Yeah, they are clean, let's say. And then you put the socket around it. Yeah. OK. And then you seal the bottom of the socket because you're going to pour fluid into the socket. So you need to seal off the bottom of your socket that it won't drip out, let's say. You see, so this is a special tape we're going to put in there. Yeah, OK. And then we put it into the stand. In our workshop, we have different st uh, stands like this. So when we do the pouring, we can pour several um, sockets at a time. Yeah. There you got it. And then, OK, we prepare the raisin. You have a fluid uh, part and you mix it up with the powder. Yeah, and once it's fully mixed you can immediately start pouring it into the sockets you see you put some in first so things will get deeper and deeper into the socket and then you pour some more so then in the end you're going to see that this is uh, to the right Level, you see, it's gonna it's, it's gonna going down, down, down. So you wait, and then you put some more in it, and then this is the end situation. And then you wait for about uh, let's say an hour, yeah. And uh, the socket and the the raisin will warm up till about 50, 60, or 70 degrees. So uh, there is a chemical reaction, yeah. What you can see here is then the uh, end. Um, sockets, we normally put a um, uh, mark plate in it with uh, who's done it, where it is done, with a number so that things can be checked afterwards. Huh? Um, we also regrease the little part on the, uh, the socket, which was uh, eventually also degreased. So we put a special grease also uh, under the sockets so that uh, the socket and uh, the part under the socket is regreased again. So this is, uh, let's say, the raisin type of uh, pouring on. Yeah. 
in some countries, uh, and especially in Germany, there are still sockets poured on with fluid metal uh, alloy, or let's say uh, Zamak. It is hot metal, which has to be uh, poured in at about 340 degrees. Um, the sockets are reusable, but uh, be careful. Every time you're going to uh, socket it on with uh, hot metal, you have high temperatures and sometimes, uh, yeah, you're uh, going to heat it up above 340 degrees and then uh, you have a changement of uh, your uh, socket uh, uh, material. Yeah, of course, you have also deterioration of the wires by temperatures uh, with this kind of casting. Yeah, um, you have also 100% efficiency and um, yeah, the same uh, um, procedure uh, about uh, the, the the wire lock uh, reason uh, is done, but of course it's much difficult to do it because you have to take care of high temperatures, um, uh, warming up the, the the sockets and so on. Um, you have the advantage that if you need to um, um, use the the socket again then you can uh, let drip out the, the hot metal of the socket. If you do it with uh, wire lock raisin, yeah, you have to press the complete conus out of the socket. So there you're going to need a press or something to um, empty the socket. That's it with uh, sockets. I show you here some more different kind of uh, sockets like pair sockets, which are uh, very common in bands. And sometimes you have here on the right side, uh, typically uh, sockets from Daymark or from other brands. You can uh, use them. Um, due to the easy uh, procedure of socketing, um, the last uh, 15 uh, years, uh, we invented, let's say, end stops for socketing on ropes. This is uh, done with uh, let's say, uh, smaller uh, pieces of end stops, as you can see, with special um, houses or with special sockets where this uh, end stop will fit in. Yeah, um, The dimensions of uh, the socket and dimensions of the end stop are the special for each uh, type of uh, uh, brand, Liebherr, Demac, Manito Walk, Found. So it is done mostly on non-rotating ropes for easy reeving or multiple reeving on mobile cranes, yeah. And you can use it also if you have damages on uh, non-rotating ropes for shortening your wire rope uh, and uh, yeah, so the, that you don't need to buy a whole new rope with uh, an end fitting. Efficiency is uh, into the norm, must be 90% or more but we uh, can guarantee you that it will be mostly 100%. So they fit into certain uh, sockets depending on uh, the brand uh, of uh, uh, crane you're going to put it on. Yeah. And saying typically uh, brand um, specialized uh, things can look like this. You can see there are a lot of different uh, end uh, fittings and stops to put on ropes, each with its uh, specific uh, dimensions, uh, length, uh, width. Um, yeah, so be careful that you use the right uh, end stop to be fitted on your rope um, and that this uh, end stop will fit into a specific uh, socket. Uh, from all these different uh, brands of uh, crane makers. Yeah. OK, another one uh, still uh, used is the hand splice. I mean, splicing strands into the core by hand using uh, the right procedure. Um, where is it still done? Well, it is done where a ferrule is not used or wished because it's going to be in the way uh, that ferrule. And uh, in, um, initially, it was used to um, uh, um, have uh, hand splice where there are very high temperatures. Because, OK, don't you have the ferrule? You don't have uh, uh, the, the, the switched ferrule, which is limited in temperature. So there, all the strands uh, are uh, spliced into uh, the core, into the rope. 
and uh, temperatures can be used till, uh, let's say, the temperatures from your wires or your rope. It is, of course, expensive because uh, it is this hand splicing. It costs a lot of time and expertise, and the efficiency there is about 80%. So due to uh, splicing with hand splice into the core, you're going to lose 20% of the minimum breaking load. Yeah. Okay, some people still use wire rope clips. Yeah, as you can see here, um, uh, wire rope clips can be used, but be careful. Saddle always on the working part. Yeah, you see three of these wire clips. They all are uh, mounted in the right way. Yeah? So uh, use it like this. You see the death part will take uh, uh, the upper side of your uh, uh, clip. Efficiency is about 60 to 70 percent. It depends also on the type of rope, but be careful. Efficiency 60 to 70 percent if you use the right number of clips. So each diameter of your rope yeah, has a certain number of clips uh, you're going to put on the rope. So for instance, if it's eight millimeter, you're going to use two clips. I say if it's 12 or 14 millimeter rope, you're going to use six clips and so on. So the higher the diameter, the more clips you have to put on uh, your uh, uh, rope. You see the distance between the different wire rope clips uh, are five times the diameter of the rope. Huh? Yeah, then if you have put the wire rope clips on your rope, you use a torque wrench to get the right um, tension on your wire rope clips. So you're going to use a torque wrench just to have uh, the right uh, um, numbers to put it on. And then, very important, after sometimes you need to check that torque again because the rope will get thinner in diameter due to uh, um, uh, uh, to put the, lo the load on it. So you need to check again. If you do that, all these things will give you 60 to 70 percent. Now, let's be honest, nobody is doing this uh, properly, and that's why I would propose it not to use it for permanent hoisting applications. So don't use wire rope clips in situations where you have a hoisting application. Yeah? I have to tell you, check in uh, your country if it's still, uh, uh, um, let's say, normal to use these things. I can tell you that in Belgium it is forbidden. It is forbidden to use wire rope clips for permanent hoisting applications. Yeah. So only for emergency uh, things you can use it to hold up a rope which uh, has, uh, let's say, a problem, or for temporarily for cases like, uh, for instance, reeving, then you could put some uh, clips on it just to, to pull your rope uh, into your installation. So please, I have to mention again, not for permanent hoisting applications. Another termination, very uh, common and used on um, overhead cranes, is a wedge socket. This is for quick mounting uh, rope, uh, let's say, uh, easy, quickly. And uh, if you have to replace the rope, it's much easier to do it. So it is a house with a wedge. Be careful that house and wedge came from the same brand. Uh, very important. There are different designs for uh, different constructions of the rope. So some have wedges which are, let's say, bigger or um, even more adapted to the type of rope. And also be careful to do um, a clip onto the tail to block the wedge so that the rope can't go loose if you have a shock or something. Efficiency is certainly lower than 80%. Yeah. So it all depends, let's say, on the type of rope, uh, non rotating rope or um, high performance ropes. So uh, efficiency, you're going to lose certainly about 20%. And for some high performance run rotating ropes, there have been a development uh, by Crosby for a special uh, wedge 
uh, sockets like you see there, where you can uh, have certainty that your non-rotating row will gain about 80% efficiency. Yeah. Yeah, other things you can put on your rope is a pulling eye. Yeah, there's a welded uh, chain link, let's say, at the end of the wire. This is for uh, pulling your rope into your installation or for weaving uh, or for fixing uh, a rope uh, easily on your drum, on your hoisting drum. Um, you also can use for uh, mounting ropes or dismounting ropes a Chinese finger, a uh, cable sock also, that's a woven cable grip. You put it on, uh, let's say, uh, the used rope or you put it on the, the new rope so you can uh, uh, um, uh, pull it in into your installation. Efficiency, well, that depends. It's about 10 to 30 percent. You don't need uh, much more than this. It's just for uh, taking the rope and uh, pulling uh, it into the installation. OK, and now something for uncoiling and cutting steel wire rope. I show you the only right thing to do. If the pictures will start just a minute. Yeah. Yeah, that's technique, guys. It's much easier <laughs> doing rope <laughs> than uh, OK. Um, oh, hold on. No, wait a minute. There it goes. Yeah, OK. So. Let's talk about two things, how you can treat your rope properly. This is not the way you treat a rope. Everybody who is familiar to rope will know that this will get you into big troubles. The rope will be destroyed, so kinks. You use your rope every time if you're going to lay it down or you're pulling it in. You put it on the ground like this or be certain it's going to be on a reel or on a coil which will turn. And then for cutting rope, it is certain if you cut a rope like this and certainly the high performance ropes, yeah, it's going to split and it's going to be terrible. Your rope will be damaged. You're not going to correct it. So what you need to do is you do seizing on a six and eight strand rope. Yeah, you do two times seizing on a special rope or a non-rotating rope, you do it four times. Yeah, and then you cut it immediately through in one seizing and in one cutting through. And if possible, uh, if it is a non-rotating rope or a high performance rope, you can fuse it, uh, uh, you can fuse the ends so that the rope won't uh, open up again. So very important, don't pull your rope, you coil it or uncoil it and uh, be careful when you cut the rope you have to do the right seizing two times or four times depending on the quality of your rope and if you have questions about this uh, well we can show you more just call us and uh, we will inform you how to do it okay that's it i think for okay. my part let's wrap up i've uh, talked about um, all different kind of uh, standard procedures for end terminations. I know there are some others uh, for specific uh, uh, applications, but um, let's see what uh, we can have already for some um, questions who popped up. I don't know. Michelle is yeah. going to look. But just uh, to tell you that there is another uh, uh, webinar coming up. Um, I think the beginning of next year. Then we're going to talk about uh, ridging arrangements, sheaves, drums, and blocks. So uh, I will invite you today already to join next time. Thank you for your attention so far. Thanks so much, Ellen. Um, um, we have some questions uh, in the chats. Uh, uh, first of all, after this webinar, I think it will be end of this week, you'll receive the recording of this webinar, the slides and also the Q&A all in one in one uh, email. Uh, so then you can see it again. Um, OK, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, how do you decide the length of the brush? Yeah, that depends on uh, the procedure. Uh, so you have uh, the, the diameter of the rope 
and then you have to uh, calculate it. So this is done in the procedure. It's depending on if it's six stranded or eight stranded or um, uh, that there's that depend on uh, what is written in the procedure. So you mean the length of the yeah, if you Approach, open yeah. it up, you you're going to lose some length too because you have to make a, a broom. Yeah, so that it, it is uh, written into the procedure. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Uh, we got a question from Jesper Helman from NOV. How is the steel wire grommet manufactured? Yeah, but this is, uh, uh, let's say, one uh, of the different uh, kinds of um, um, grommet making things. It's uh, not easy to explain this, but in general, uh, what you use is uh, uh, you use one rope, yeah, and you put it into an endless loop, yeah, and then six times, yeah, you the the same rope is woven around uh, the, the the core. Let's say it's not easy to explain this, but um, yeah, this can be treated in the next uh, uh, seminar. Okay, <coughs> but it is done done by hand, or some of these um, um, uh, uh, rope makers have a special machine for it. Uh, but it is generally so an endless uh, rope, which is six times woven around its own core. Yeah. And then you have uh, a grommet. Yeah. Sometimes you also have uh, uh, cable led slings. And this is, uh, let's say, also uh, a rope made out of ropes, not of strands. The strands are ropes. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, they put. Um, uh, some terminations on it, uh, eyes uh, to be swaged or timbles to be swaged, or sometimes they're going to hand splice it also. But this is a, a, a completely um, other uh, topic, let's say. Can't explain it just like this. I need to <laughs> prepare some slides for it, and then you can see how these things are made. Yep. Great. Special. We'll explain a little bit in the Q&A, but also yep. in the next yep. coming up webinar. Yeah, okay. okay. Regarding socketing with raisin, you mentioned an expiration date. Is it for the raisin before pouring or also for using the socket? No, no, not for the socket. It's just for um, mixing up your raisin. This raisin um, is made out of a fluid and some powder. Yeah. And the fluid and the powder, they have an expiration date. So it's just like uh, medication. Uh, you don't use it after a certain date. Yeah? Yeah? And normally it's, a, I think, one and a half year or two years. Yeah. Uh, for the raisin also, if you mix your uh, two components, you have to be sure that your um, mix is done at 13 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Because if it is lower than 13 degrees Celsius, in the case of wire lock, then uh, the hardening of your uh, raisin will last much longer. So it takes then, let's say, hours and hours to get uh, stiff, to have your cone formed. So then you can add some uh, little power uh, powder, also uh, what's it called, um, um, uh, power uh, kits to add. So mm -hmm. this will fasten uh, the it will fasten the hardening of uh, your raisin, yeah? And it's called booster sockets, uh, socks, I think. So you have to use uh, one or more of these booster uh, uh, packages into your raisin to harden it uh, much uh, uh, quickly. So if you are pouring your raisin into your sockets in your workshop, there normally won't be a problem. But if you do it uh, uh, on the job, huh? Um, next to the grain or something, then you have to be careful that it is done at um, uh, minimum 13 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, you need to do uh, extra booster packets into your raisin. Yeah. Okay. Long answer, but I think it's fair <laughs> enough. Yeah, but uh, it's important. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. Uh, is there a table available to know the number of clips? Yeah. Yeah, depending on the type of clips, because there are certain uh, types of clips. You have DIN uh, for, uh, 1142, you have clips uh, DIN 741, uh, 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 
you have this uh, high performance clips uh, from Greenpin, from Crosby. You look it up into the catalog or you can uh, use our website uh, to see how many clips you need to use. But again, use it only in emergencies or don't use it for um, applications on um, permanent hoisting ropes. Yeah. OK, and another question about clips. Where can I find the amount of pressure I can apply to a certain yeah. cable? Well, normally, normally if you buy uh, the clips um, at uh, Certex or Manon's, or you, you're going to uh, have an application form or how to do it. And there, uh, the, the, the moment you're going to need to put on the clips, yeah? Uh, uh, are written into a table or also on your uh, user using guide, which is normally with uh, with the clips. Yeah? yeah, and be careful that after the time you do the exercise again. Yeah, because normally rope which are loaded are gonna uh, um, diminish in diameter, and then you need to do the. Uh, fitting of your uh, of your clips uh, with the with the wrench uh, again. Yeah, so that's why. Sorry, but that's why people uh, can't use it anymore in Belgium. Not for uh, application. There were some bad accidents, and then then okay, the third party uh, inspectors they forbidden to use um, these clips for hoisting applications. Yeah. So use other end terminations on overhead cranes or on other applications. Use other end terminations. Do it not with these clips. Yeah, OK. All right, let's pick a couple of more. There are more questions coming in, but regarding efficiency, code EN13411, five states 80% and Crosby 80, 90%. You mentioned 60 to 70%. Yeah. Can you tell the reason why? Um, it is prescritten that it should be 90%, but we have the experience that you're never going to get 90%. I wrote 80% yeah, into uh, the seminar because this is the real um, uh, percentage, the maximum percentage you're going to get. There are some manufacturers who did tests on this and they end up with the maximum of 80%. Even with non-rotating ropes, yeah, 80% is the maximum you're going you're gonna, to uh, attend to. And uh, if somebody is uh, saying that it's more than 80%, then he has to prove it. Yeah. So we're speaking about this wedge socket, I think. Eh? So yeah. really, with uh, certain um, brands, like Crosby or uh, other um, uh, makers of uh, uh, um, wedge socket. Be careful, it all depends on the wedge you're going to use, the diameter of the wedge, the type of uh, socket. Uh, be sure uh, that it is safe, that is well um, mounted, uh, that you always have a clip to uh, ensure the security that the wedge and the rope can't slip away. And uh, um, take care that you're only going to have 80%, not more than 80% of your minimum breaking load. Yeah. Okay. Mikael Raven, what is the efficiency of a swagless terminal? A what? Swag, swageless, sorry. A swageless terminal. What is the efficiency of a swageless terminal? I don't understand a swageless terminal. What is a switchless terminal? I don't know. Perhaps Mikael can uh, put in uh, an extra chat. Otherwise, uh, let's go to the next question. Perhaps he means also a switchless. Perhaps he also means uh, a wedge socket with a wedge something. Yeah, it's not in this question. Uh, so, um, okay. but sorry. No worries. <laughs> uh, depending on the diameter of the rope, how much pressure can it withstand before being damaged and on what surface at the torque? on wire grips is only specified for the threat? Long question. That's a big one. That's a big question. Can you repeat it? All right, please? let's let's put it in uh, into uh, two parts. Depending on the diameter of the rope, how much pressure can it withstand before being damaged? 
Yeah, well, uh, uh, I think the question is, are we sure that we don't damage the rope uh, with a ferrule pressed on it or with uh, uh, swaged on it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like in the, the procedure of, a, of a, the Flemish eye? You're going to not uh, damage the rope itself if you use the right number, let's say, of ferrule, and if you use the proper dye for it. Yeah? All this uh, is written into procedures. Every dye and every uh, ferrule has his uh, typically press. Yeah? You have to uh, apply, I don't know how many tons on your uh, dyes. So this is all prescritten. Yeah? Normally you have to be sure that you use the right dyes and that the two part of the dyes are closed into your press. But to tell you how many tons and so on, this is typically for the type of press and it is prescritten uh, for every um, die and for every press. So it depends on uh, which uh, type of uh, press you have. Yeah, okay. Two more questions to go. About your experience, experience which do you think would be the best or more common socket for cranes? Sockets for cranes. Uh, if you mean uh, mobile cranes, yeah then things are getting a lot easier uh, due to uh, yeah, 15 or 10 years ago with this end fittings uh, easily for uh, reaving up to multiple reaving systems into blocks. Uh, the problem was that there was okay an end stop which was fitted on the new rope and if your rope got damaged you have to replace the whole rope. Huh? And now we have this, uh, let's say, uh, easy socketing on uh, end stops. So you can cut your rope where it is damaged. And then just by uh, pouring the, the end stop on it, yeah, uh, then you can use your rope again. Yeah? Uh, the fitting itself has to be uh, adjusted to, uh, I mean, you have to use the right fitting for the right uh, socket, which is on uh, your rope, and you don't need to buy a whole new rope. Yeah? So it is very common, but of course you have to be certain that uh, the, the, the end fitting, the end stop, is the right one for your uh, socket, which is on, uh, on your crane. Um, that's it for non-rotating. Mm -hmm. In some applications, uh, these kind of fittings also can be used on six or eight strand uh, ropes. Um, and then normally the fitting will be so constructed that you can't turn the fitting into the socket. So that the, the, the socket and the uh, end fitting are blocked together so that the rope uh, cannot rotate uh, into the socket. Great. Uh, are there any situations or applications where only white metal can be used and resin is not suitable? Um, what we have seen is for nuclear uh, plants, they don't know what the effect would be on resin into, uh, poured into sockets after, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. Uh, due to radiation which gets into the uh, raisin. So therefore, it is not used in nuclear power plants. Uh, and there, socketing is normally uh, done with uh, liquid uh, uh, metal. I think that's the only application mm -hmm. where I know from which uh, it is not forbidden, let's say, but they don't have experience on it because this kind of raisin uh, thing is only, yeah, let's say, uh, uh, on the market for the last uh, 20 or 30 years. So they don't do it or they don't advise it in uh, nuclear plants. But um, otherwise, yeah, um, um, these uh, metal um, um, liquid to pour in mm -hmm. has uh, the advantage that um, um, for emptying the socket again, you just uh, apply the right temperature, yeah, and um, for uh, um, raising, 
to compound raising, you have to press it out. So you need to have equipment to press it out. So this is an advantage for the uh, liquid uh, pouring on, yeah, liquid uh, metal pouring on. Disadvantage, as I told you in the explication, yeah. you have this temperature which will deteriorate um, your uh, wires anyhow, uh, because these wires will be uh, heated up till uh, 340 degrees. Yeah, and also your socket will deteriorate if you use your socket several times. Yeah, be careful that you don't uh, get higher than 350 degrees, 300. You have to be careful with your temperature that you don't overheat it because otherwise you're going to deteriorate your uh, material of the socket. That's it for um, socketing with uh, liquid uh, metal. Yeah. OK, then we're done with all the questions. We okay. thank you, Mikael, for uh, for sending over the link what you mean meant with with Swedish, but uh, due to timing, uh, we will respond to you directly due to one of our local companies or by LN or in the Q&A. Uh, so this ends up the um, this webinar. Would like to thank you again uh, for participating in this webinar. Uh, during the week, I think the end of the week or Monday, you will receive an email with all the documentation, recording, presentation slides and the Q&A. And uh, if you have any questions, please go to your local company or send us an email. And uh, I hope you had a, had a good time at this webinar. Thanks again, Alain. And uh, <laughs> see you soon, beginning of next year. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.